Okay, so uh, last new material for the for the whole course. Um, this is the second part of granitoids, and again, heavily, heavily influenced by Todd's lectures because he, he actually knows what he's talking about with granites. So, all right. Um, so we talked a tiny bit about uh, about crustal melting. We're going to go a bit further on that and talk about why the crust melts, and then we'll talk about how uh, granitoids migrate to where they actually end up. Um, so under normal conditions, uh, continental crust does not melt. Um, and the reason for this is that if you look at typical geotherms, and geotherms are just the, the way that temperature increases as we go down through the crust, um, they don't really intersect the wet melting curve and they definitely don't intersect these these dehydration melting areas so this is a range of typical geotherms on earth uh, at the low temperature end this would maybe be in subduction zones and stuff where you have uh, very you have relatively cold stuff moving down quickly and you can get into blue schist fasces uh, maybe on the on the high end you can get up into amphibolite fasces but this is average continental crustal thickness so we're not really going to cross this melting curve in, in most cases. So if we, want to, if we want to force the crust to melt, the two options would be we can increase the thickness of the crust and then these geotherms which would, would carry on and they'd eventually cross the, the wet solidus. Um, or we can increase the temperature of the crust which is just moving in this direction. And we can do that by adding fresh magma from the mantle which is hot or by increasing the heat flow to the, the crust. So in terms of thickening crust, um, this, this kind of does a bit of both. We're both making the base of the crust deeper, and so we're more like we've got more time for that, that geotherm to cross the, cross the solidus. And it also actually ends up increasing the temperature. So we get thicker crust in both continental collisions and in continental arcs. Uh, well, in arcs of any sort, actually, but particularly in continental arcs. So in continental collisional zones, at the extreme end, you have uh, the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, and the crust underneath Tibet is up to 90 kilometers thick. Uh, under continental arcs, under parts of the Andes, it gets up to about 70 kilometers thick, maybe 74 at the high end. Um, and what this does is because continental crust is, is really high in radioactive elements compared to the mantle, um, you basically build up this thick radioactive layer, and it's almost like having an electric blanket. It's both keeping you warm because there's a stack of other stuff on top, but there's also more heat being produced than if you compare it to uh, thin crust, which is underlain by, by mantle, which doesn't have many radioactive elements in it. Um, and so basically we end up building up quite high temperatures. You can see in, in this example, this is just like a kind of hypothetical continental collision. It was a subduction zone, this was oceanic crust end up pulling some of the continent under, we get this really, really thick crust, and we might hit temperatures up to about 1,000 degrees C or so. Um, this is a cross-section through the Himalayas. Um, so here's India and the Indian Shield, which is, which is a very old crust. Um, these are the rocks of the Asian continent that are being thrust over the top of it uh, as a nap. This is Everest, and then back here in Tibet, where we've got the really, really thick crust, we get this big partial melting zone um, where, where it's forming granite. Um, in continental arcs, you have the extra heat and fluids. Oh, sorry, go on, Nadia. Um, how big is the um, it's typical. I think the average is 40, um, maybe like normal away from mountain uh, building areas and that kind of thing might be like 35. Um, so it's still a lot thicker than oceanic crust, but it's not really, it's not really thick enough that it's going to normally melt. Yeah, so in continental arcs, we both have potentially this quite thick crust, and then we've also got extra heat being added by, by the arc magmas that are rising up through the, cluster, uh, the crust. We've also got fluids from, from the arc and, and the arc magmas, so this can, this can really help us with melting. So in a continental arc, you can both melt the existing continental crust that was you know, unrelated to the subduction. You can also remelt these, what they call basaltic underplate, or this, this is what, what I've referred to as the mass shown before, melting assimilate, assimilation, um, hybridization, I can't remember what that stands for. Um, and so, so we, we could have melts that are coming up from the mantle, they're crystallizing in that deep area, they may be getting altered by fluids coming up from the subduction zone, and then they might get remelted later. Um, we can also have zones with high heat flow that are away from thickened crust. And 
the main ones here are going to be at uh, continental rifts or areas where the where the crust is thinning. Um, so in terms of continental rift, and I obviously said that the, the mantle doesn't have as many radioactive elements, but when you start stretching the crust, it's also stretching the lithospheric mantle below. And that allows uh, a stenospheric mantle that's hot to upwell into that area. And it can do two things. One is you can get a bit of decompression melting, like we might see at um, you know, a, a, a normal continental rift or even one of these like continental flood basalt events. The other thing is you're actually bringing the hottest stenospheric mantle closer to the crust. So you can just, you're directly increasing the heat flow like that. Um, there's also this thing called uh, post orogenic collapse. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a number of reasons why this might happen. But basically, after you end a mountain building event, you almost always see some sort of like rifting or extensional event afterwards. So it's almost like, you know, you build up this thick amount of crust and then it kind of just like collapses and, and stretches out. And you also get high heat flow for, for these areas. You can have a bit of decompression melting, again, similar to the continental rift. And because you're thinning the lithosphere as well then you have a way of bringing mantle closer to the crust and heating it up, a stenospheric mantle, the, the hot stuff. So we can, also, um, we can also get these kind of high heat flow granites in, in other settings. Um, you can actually get them at mid-ocean ridges and ocean islands, but they're really small volume and, and we're not really gonna worry about those much. So we've done melting, but um, granitoid magmas are really, really silicic and they have high viscosity. So it's actually quite hard to, to get it out once you've melted it. So we talked about uh, way back when in the, the first lecture, I think, that basaltic melts are, because they're low viscosity, because they're very mobile, they can be extracted after 1% melting in the mantle. So basically you start to melt and then it starts to move up very quickly. Um, granites probably need something like 15 to 35 percent melting before they can actually move depending on the exact viscosity and so at low degrees of melting you have migmatites we've basically got the restite trapped with the melt and they've not been able to separate um so going back to our, our you know melting and metasedimentary rocks uh the first little blip of melting with muscovite breakdown probably won't produce enough melt to, to let the granite move so then you probably have to wait until the degree of melting gets higher when, when biotite starts to break down. And this band across here, this critical melt fractionation range, this is the range of, of melt percent, uh, percentages that you need before your granite can begin to move. So at this point, once we've got an appreciable amount of melting from biotite breakdown, the granite can start to leave its, its source region to separate from the restite and to move upwards. So because they're so uh, high viscosity, um, it's quite difficult for them to flow. It's quite difficult for them, for them to ascend through the crust. So unlike mafic magmas, they're not typically ascending in, in thin dikes. Um, the kind of classic idea for how granitoids move is that they're these, these large diapids. So these are, are buoyant rising domes of, of melt and crystals. And there's a, there's a picture here showing what this might look like. So maybe you have this big zone of partially molten restite and granite and at some point you get enough melt and enough buoyancy that it separates off and it forms this kind of upward moving diaper and you might recognize this from the from the lava lamp stuff and the, the mantle um, plumes like it is it's a very similar process we just have buoyant material that's punching up through and once it's kind of moved up through the crust this big buoyant head it's actually easier for stuff to follow it up afterwards um so these diapers push aside, they partially melt, and they incorporate some of the surrounding uh, country rocks um, as they rise. This is a, a cross-section from a structural geology paper that was looking at one of these diapirs. I think it's near Beijing. And you can see here, you have this big mass of granite, and you can see how it's pushing up these, these lower layers and bringing them up into the, into the upper crust. Some of, those, um, some of those rocks will actually get incorporated into the, into the granitoid pluton as well. We can see enclaves of, of the surrounding country rock in some of these. Um, I was slightly surprised here uh, when, I was, when I was reading about it. This, this model is a bit debated at the minute and some people think that plutons are lots of small amounts of melt ascending through dikes. Um, but I think this is, this, this is kind of the, the, the safer model. That's the one, it's the, it's the traditional model. So that's what we'll go with. Um, batholiths. So as I said before, these things can be up to hundreds of kilometers long and 
they, they often just look like this monotonous mass of, of granite that all, all looks the same. But when you look in detail, um, different batholiths, uh, batholiths are formed of completely different uh, plutons that can be completely different types of granite and they can be formed at different times. So this on the right is a map of this uh, of a particular batholith up in the Yukon in northern Canada. I think this so this is a 10 kilometer scale. It's something like 60 kilometers across. Um, it looks like just a single body of magma. But when you go in detail and actually date the different um, generations, you can see that the, it actually formed over a, of a period of almost 25 million years. So it's really drawn out um, formation. So there was an initial burst between 114 and 104 million years ago. And this is a S-type granite that I'll talk about later. Then there was another burst between 99 and 95 million years ago. And then finally, uh, that's an I-type granite. And we'll also talk about that later. And then finally, there's this late, uh, late kind of intrusion that was a mix of I and S type. Um, so these batholiths, this is why I referred to them as composite batholiths before. They're really different plutons from at different times, potentially with different magmas um, and building up in the same place. All right, so normally the continental crust doesn't melt. Um, it can melt if it's heated or thickened. Uh, crustal thickening at arcs and collision zones heats the crust because of this kind of electric blank blanket effect. It also thickens it, which means the base of the crust is at a higher temperature. Um, magma supplied at arcs or continental rifts can directly heat up the crust, but also rifting and crustal thinning can increase the heat flow from the mantle by bringing hot stenospheric mantle closer up to the crust. Uh, granitoid melts are very viscous and they can only escape the sources after high degrees of melting. They may then rise as diapirs to make plutons and batholiths. Everyone with me? Um, all right, alphabet granitoids. Um, so these alphabet granitoids, this is, it's, it's a system of granitoid classification. And the S-type and the I-type that I referred to earlier are, are some of these, these types of granitoid. So it was originally developed for the, the Lackland Fold Belt, or sorry, I think it's Lack, yeah, Lackland, that shouldn't have a D on it, uh, in Eastern Australia. So here's Melbourne, here's Canberra, and Everything in black here are these, these various uh, granitoids. Um, so it was, it's from this really famous uh, paper, which is actually just like a, it was an abstract, which is say like a summary before a talk at a conference, um, that they then republished 25 years later and expanded on. And, and you can see that on Absalon if you want to read it. Um, I would recommend giving it a look because it's quite like an easy scientific paper to get through. It's relatively, um, intelligible and, and it might be good practice for you guys if you because um, I think you'll probably end up reading more uh, scientific papers next year but yeah they, they basically define these two types of granite and they call them S type and I type um, S for sedimentary source material and I for igneous source material and it was originally only defined for this particular fold belt but since then um, it's used, been used globally and people have added a bunch of different letters which is why they call them alphabet granitoids so we have S-type, I-type. A-type, this means anorogenic, so not in, a, in an orogeny, not a mountain building event, or anhydrous. Um, M-type is for mantle source. I'm not going to uh, deal with that at all. We're just going to ignore it. And then there's this H-type for hybrid, and we're, we're also going to ignore that. So this classification is based on a combination of geochemistry and, and the mineral assemblage. And a really important thing in this classification is the Alumina Saturation Index, or ASI. Um, the ASI is just the molar aluminium divided by the molar sodium, potassium, and calcium. And I think this is, is really well illustrated in this diagram. And we do molar because that way we're cancelling out the, the fact that these different elements weigh different amounts. And you can see um, if it's if the ASI is high, <laughs> if the ASI is high, then we have more aluminium than the sum of calcium, potassium, and sodium. And this is called peraluminous. And this is what S-type granites tend to be like. Um, if the ASI is kind of somewhere in the middle, then we have about the same amount of aluminium as calcium, potassium, and sodium. This is called metaluminous. And that's typical of I-types. And then in the A-type, we actually have more 
potassium and sodium on their own, even ignoring the calcium, then we have aluminium. And these are called per alkaline because they've got lots of alkaline metals. So the reason this is important is it kind of relates to what minerals crystallize from the, from the granite. And the, the way that I kind of think about it is what we're asking here is, is most of the aluminium accounted for in, in feldspars, right? If we have an ASI that's uh, somewhere in the middle, then aluminium, potassium, sodium, calcium, we've got about one of each of those for every aluminium, so we could make plagioclase with that fairly easily. Albite is, is one to one, right? There's one sodium for every aluminium. Um, if we have more aluminium than that, then we need to find some other mineral that can soak up aluminium. And so we start to see more aluminium rich minerals like biotite, muscovite, cordurite, and alucite. This is another aluminosilicate and garnet. And then if we have more potassium and sodium than aluminium, then we need some other mineral that's going to take up these excess alkalis. So this is where we get these. These are weird alkali pyroxenes, adrene, and then alkali amphiboles like rubicite or arfvedsonite. Um, okay, so taking these one by one, uh, I-type granites are defined as having an uh, alum aluminous saturation index of less than 1.1. They're metaluminous or aluminium undersaturated, so we don't need to produce extra aluminium rich phases. These have a really wide range of compositions. They start with a silica content of about 50% and go all the way up to quite evolved granites. Um, the characteristic minerals are uh, amphibole, which is hornblende, um, which, which might be green, but it's, um, it otherwise looks fairly similar to the stuff you've seen in arcs. Uh, Biotite that is often yellow green, so not the red brown to, to yellow that you're used of you used to, sorry, it will be a kind of yellow green player croism. There's also titanite that we talked about in the last lecture. There's the wedge shape. Uh, magnetite, and then of course, because they're granitoids, there's quartz, there's K Felsbar, there's plagioclase. S-type granites um, have an al aluminous saturation index of more than 1.1, so the peraluminous or aluminium saturated. So we need to have extra minerals, high aluminium minerals crystallizing in addition to our feldspars. So these generally only form at pretty high silica compositions above 65 weight percent silica. And the characteristic minerals are muscovite. You can see it here with its kind of fairly trippy, bright, second order interference colors. Uh, there's biotite and in S-type granites, the biotite will usually be red brown, more like what you're used to from subduction zone rocks. Um, there's cordurite, there's garnet, ilmenite, aluminosilicates, and of course, quartz, plagioclase, and K feldspar. Not all S types will necessarily have all of these, but it will have some of these high aluminium minerals. All right, so this kind of original chapel and white model um, the idea was that um, it, having a high aluminous saturation index, so we've got lots of aluminium compared to sodium. Uh, potassium and calcium um, in S-type granites reflects a sedimentary source. And the reason for this is that sources that have undergone sufficient weathering, so let's say you have some continental crust, um, it gets weathered, you break down feldspars, which is gonna release calcium, sodium, potassium, aluminum, and silicon. But all of the, uh, the calcium, sodium, and potassium can stay in solution, and it will basically end up in seawater, it might end up being precipitated as evaporites like you saw down in Spain or it might uh, or might end up in limestone or something like that um, but it's not it's not really going to be incorporated into normal um, clastic sediments by contrast the aluminium goes into clays and aluminium is very insoluble and ends up in clays these end up in, uh, in sedimentary rocks and so our sedimentary rock already has a high ASI um, when you then melt that sedimentary source, the, the, the granite that's formed from it should also have a high ASI. ASI. Um, the presence of this red pleochroic biotite um, is interpreted to mean that there's a fairly reduced source, and you could get that if you have some graphite in the, in the sedimentary rocks. Um, for I-type sources, um, these are, again, like the igneous rock sources, it's not gone through a a sedimentary cycle. It's not been weathered, it's not, uh, you know, kind of been washed into a sediment and then uh, deposited and, and metamorphosed like that. So the idea here is that these are sort of deep crustal sources, some sort of igneous rock that was there in the crust, never made it to the surface and gets remelted. 
Um, and here they interpret the green biotite and the fact that it has magnetite instead of ilmenite as, as being like a more oxidized source. It doesn't have graphite like, like a lot of shales would. Um, this model is, is fairly simple. Like they're, they're basically saying that the S-types are, are pretty much pure sedimentary sources and the I-types are pretty much pure igneous sources. And so they're, they're basically saying that there's no new um, input coming from the mantle. And the implication for that is that when you make these granites, you're not actually growing the continental crust. You're just taking, you know, high-grade metamorphic material and moving it around. Um, so both uh, S-type and I-type granites do contain some evidence for mantle input. So um, there's a bunch of isotopic things that, that point to mantle input that we're not really covering isotopes in this course at all. Um, you can look at zircons, which I'll talk about later. And then probably the most obvious is that we see enclaves of mantle-derived melts. So I'm not quite sure where these granites are from, but let's say it's from a subduction zone. Maybe you find some basaltic andesite stuck in your granite. Um, and so this is telling us, you know, again, at a subduction zone, we're expecting a lot of juvenile magnetism. Some of that is getting incorporated into these granites. Some of it is, um, is playing a part in the granite generation. It's not purely within the crust. Now, if we take this, this idea of the igneous versus sedimentary type and, and look at them in different tectonic settings, um, we see that actually most continental arc granite, granites are I-type. And so that kind of makes sense, right? From our, our model of forming um, granites at a subduction zone, we have all this mantle melt, and it's both melting uh, continental crust, but there's also a ton of juvenile igneous material in this mash zone that we can melt to make uh, you know, I-type granites. And so, yeah, looking at the, um, the South American granites, which kind of extend all the way along the Andes, where there's been subduction ongoing for a very long time, um, a very, very high proportion of those are I-type granites. If we compare that to the Himalayas, where we don't expect as much juvenile magmatism going on, we've just got thick and crust, but the, the subduction zone's kind of locked up there, um, we actually see that most of the granites are S-type. And so... Um, there's, because there's no new mantle melts being formed, there's not as much of this kind of hydrated, you know, mash zone, igneous protolith that we can actually melt. And so the high temperature is mainly coming from the thickened crust, and we're melting sedimentary rocks that have been buried uh, through the orogeny, and we're getting S-type granites. The last type that we're going to look at are these A-type granites, and A stands for anorogenic, away from mountain building events away from erogenies. And these are pretty small volume granites that are um, formed away from con convergent zones. They tend to be within plate in extensional areas like rifts. Um, the A is also sometimes used for anhydrous. They have a bit lower water content than, uh, than the other granites. They're very rich in alkalis, sodium, potassium, and silicon. And as I mentioned before, they're per alkaline. So there is more sodium plus potassium in terms of uh, moles of, uh, molar percentages, then there is aluminium. They also tend to have quite high high field strength elements, so that's zirconium, niobium, tantalum, um, high rare earth elements, and high halogens. So these are some of the volatiles we didn't talk about too much, but fluorine and chlorine. Um, so because we've got all these alkalis, we get these weird um, alkali minerals that are, that are pretty characteristic. So they tend to have a lot of alkali feldspar, They'll also have these alkali-rich anchoboles, and so this is a rebakite, um, and this this rebakite off off um, anchobol um, can have all sorts of colours. So it can be yellow, green, blue, or, or purple pleochroic. Um, so th this kind of teal, you'll never see that kind of teal colour, the bluey green in a in a horn blend. Um, we get alkali-rich pyroxene, adrene. This is basically like a um, it's a bit like a, an iron calcium pyroxene, but with a bunch of sodium substituted in. Um, and so adrene is this, it's pyroxene, it's got our pyroxene cleavage in, but it's, it's green and it's highly pleochroic. The last thing, um, oh, actually, I should mention, biotite is again back to being this brown, yellow pleochroic. And the last thing is that you get these um, intergrowths of quartz and feldspar, um, quartz and potassium feldspar here that are called um, granifier and there's a picture of it here which is actually from one of uh, Todd's papers and you can see um, 
all of these the, these bright patches here are quartz and the dark stuff in between is, is feldspar and they're intergrown in this kind of like really really complicated interwoven texture and I think um, when you turn it all the quartz goes in into extinction at the same time so these uh, even though they look like separate grains they're all part of a big messy interwoven uh, quartz grain so this happens when you have a very rapid crystallization of quartz and alkali feldspar at the eutectic all right so obviously this classification system it's a it's it's one way of doing things there, there are some problems with it um, the big issue is when you um, if you crystallize these granitoids uh, by fractional crystallization and the melts get more and more evolved once it gets a very high silica um, most I and S types end up being these peraluminous, so that's more, more aluminium than uh, calcium, sodium, potassium, um, leucogranites. And they're called leucogranites, it just means light colored granite. Um, and so they basically all have quartz, plagioclase, K feldspar, and biotite, uh, maybe with muscovite. Uh, and they're actually really hard to distinguish. There's also a bit of a problem with this. The, the way this alphabet style has grown up is that I and S type is referring to a source rock type, um, whereas the A type is referring to a tectonic setting. So it's, it's a, they're not quite compatible with each other. Um, and a lot of granites are probably some sort of mixture of sedimentary igneous and mantle derived melts. Uh, in the sources and so people have done these kind of three component mixing where you say like well the s types they're not it's not that they're purely sedimentary sources it's just that they have more sediment in the source and the i types have a bit of sediment but not as much they have more igneous rocks in the source and both have some some mantle melts um, being contributed to them so yeah rather than them being like fundamentally different these are just different proportions in the mixture all right um, so I type granites are metaluminous. This is the uh, al aluminous saturation index is less than 1.1 uh, granites with a wide range of compositions. So anything from 50% silica upwards. Um, they're thought to form from melting igneous sources and they're very common in continental arcs. S type granites are peraluminous. So the aluminous saturation index is more than 1.1 and they're mainly restricted to high silica compositions above 65 weight percent silica. Um, they are thought to have mainly sedimentary sources and they're common in continental collisions like at the Himalayas. A-type granites are alkali rich and they form in rift zones. Um, in practice this is probably a bit of an oversimplification and most granites may have mixed sedimentary igneous and mantle uh, derived rocks in their sources. Is everyone uh, on board with that? Any questions? Yeah? Why is there so much In the A type, yeah. So I didn't, I, di I didn't go into that. Um, but there's, so, I believe, um, it's something to do with the fact that they're melting at higher temperature because they're fairly anhydrous, and there's also a suggestion that some of them could have melted um, sources that had already been depleted once. So if you take a, a like an igneous protolith, you melt it once, you get an I type granite, and if you remelt the rest type, then maybe you get more of an A type granite. But I, I really don't know enough about it to give you a better answer than that. So, yeah. But I had to cover them because there's some in the practical. So, <laughs> we're gonna gonna look at some of these weird amphiboles. All right, the very last bit. Um, and if any, so strictly, uh, we're not supposed to cause cover isotopes in this course. But I felt like I couldn't cover uh, granitoids without talking about zircon and and specifically uranium lead dating. Um, this can't be on your exam because it's outside the syllabus. So if anyone wants to piece out, it's totally fine. But I, I think this is um, this is something that has become such a fundamental part of geology and geology research that I really feel like it's good to know. Um, this may come back in some of your other courses to do with uh, sedimentary rocks. So zircon um, is kind of this like wonder mineral for dating. Um, it's incredibly useful both for dating when rocks formed and for understanding the sources of granitoids. The reason for this is it, it's really resistant to pretty much everything. Um, it's resistant to weathering, it's resistant to being eroded, it's resistant uh, to sedimentary transport, um, it can survive high-grade metamorphism, it can survive partial melting, it can be in incorporated into granites and you can still see um, the, the, the original zircon. 
Um, it forms in pretty much most granitoids. It's quite rare in mafic rocks. You can get it in some gabbros if they get quite evolved. Um, let's say like some of those, you know, those weird late crystallizing compositions we saw in, in Scareguard, those would probably be, have some zircon in them. You sometimes see it in the middle of big mafic dikes, but as a rule, you don't get it in basalts, for example. So here's a picture of zircon, and I think it's taken using this technique called cathodoluminescence luminescence imaging. It doesn't, doesn't matter too much, but basically you, you shine electrons on it, it gives off light. Um, but what's really cool with zircon is it lets you see the zoning. So in the middle here, we can see um, an unzoned core. And this is, this is from a granite, but this, this core is a xenocryst that came from the source rock of the granite. And then over the top, this core is probably being dissolved at some point, it's kind of rounded and a bit messy. Over the top, you see this really euhedral uh, oscillatory zone. So this is similar to the, the complex zoning we saw in plagioclase zircon, and that's grown from the pluton. So we have two generations of zircon, the old xenocryst and the phenocryst is grown on top. Um, you won't usually see them in thin sections just because they're quite small, um, usually less than 100 microns, but you can get them up to maybe like 400 at the high end. Um, but one way you can see them is when they're included in biotite or, or similar minerals, you get these pleochroic halos. We talked about this with, with cordurite. So basically the zircon's full of radioactive minerals and it damages the structure and it leaves a mark on it. So this is plain polarized light, this is cross polarized. It ends up being super high relief. It can have very, very high birefringence, but sometimes it's really messy because the zircon structure itself gets to, starts to get damaged by the radiation. Um, the key thing is that they've got somewhere between tens and tens of thousands of parts per million uranium and thorium, which is, which is quite a lot for those elements. Um, both of these undergo radioactive decay and the end product of this after a few intermediate steps is lead. And so we can date zircons by measuring uh, uranium and lead isotopes. And we can also do thorium, but it's not quite as useful in zircon. So everything we've been talking about so far is, is, is geochemistry, right? And that's dealing with numbers, that's dealing with different elements, which have different numbers of protons, different numbers of electrons. Um, and so we call this the atomic number, the number of protons or, or Z. Um, elements have different isotopes though, based on the number of neutrons they have. Um, if you add more neutrons, it's changing the mass, but it's not changing the chemical properties because the chemical reactions are all to do with trading electrons and making bonds between electrons. Um, so in theory, we could have any amount of neutrons for, for any amount of protons, right? If we have 28 uh, protons, we could, we could have as many as we like. But in practice, uh, only a few configurations are stable. So um, most elements will have a few, uh, one or more stable isotopes, and then you'll have a bunch of unstable ones. This is, means if you, have this, if you have that many neutrons, then it will eventually uh, undergo radioactive decay. And when unstable isotopes decay, they either form uh, different isotopes of the same element or they form another element. So uranium lead decay. Um, uranium has two isotopes in nature. Both of them are unstable because it's a really heavy element. I should have mentioned, once you get past a certain mass, every single element, every isotope is unstable. Um, below that mass, there's, there's a couple. Uh, so technetium, which is somewhere in here, has no stable isotopes, but the vast majority have at least one. Um, we measure how these things decay use, uh, using half-life that you should be fairly familiar with, I think. Um, so uranium-238 has a half-life of just under 4.5 billion years, so 4,500 million years. This makes it incredibly useful for, for dating stuff on Earth, because the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Uh, uranium-235 has a much shorter half-life, it's only 700-ish million years. And both of them initially decay by alpha decay, which is where the nucleus spits out an alpha particle, which is two protons, two neutrons. So it gets uh, lighter by a mass of, of four atomic units. Um, and they, they end up as, as isotopes of thorium. Um, for uranium-238, it goes to thorium-234. For uranium-235, it goes to thorium-231. But both of those are unstable. And the, they're actually way less stable than the uranium initially. So then starts off this big cascade of, of decays. That I've, I've put in here, you don't, you don't need to know this at all, but basically um, it decays, that, that 
the product that's formed is less stable. Those decay on a matter of days to tens of thousands of years, but these are all really short on geological timescales. And then we end up decaying all the way down to lead. Uranium-238 ends up making lead-206, and uranium-235 ends up making lead-207. Is everyone still with me? So what's great about zircon is that lead is highly incompatible in zircon. So um, because we have plenty of uranium and thorium and we have no lead to begin with, almost all of the lead in zircon is coming from this uranium and thorium decay. So if we can measure the isotopes of uranium and, uh, or the amount of uranium in a rock and we can measure the ratios of the lead isotopes, then basically we can figure out how long it is since that zircon formed because it keeps accumulating lead over time. So if we have a higher lead over uranium ratio, it implies that it's very old because the uranium is not, is not changing by a huge amount, but we're, we're growing in lead over time. So the older it is, the higher that lead over uranium ratio uh, gets. But because uh, lead's not very happy in zircon, it's incompatible, we can actually lose lead later. And so if we lost lead, for example, during a metamorphic event, we could give, get an apparently young age but what's great, again, about, uh, about the uranium lead system is we have these two different isotopes. So we can actually tell when something has lost lead compared to when it's kept it from when it crystallized. So what this, uh, what this makes is, is something called a Concordia diagram. And so on the y-axis here, we've got 206 lead divided by 238 uranium. So the older it is, we've grown more 206 lead by decaying our 238 uranium. On the x-axis, we have 207 lead over 235 uranium, and it's the same thing, but remember, uranium-235 decays faster. So at the present day, there's not much uranium-235 left, but in the early Earth, there was loads of it. And so we can basically say, if a mineral formed at 3.5 billion years ago and then just sat there and decayed uranium, it would have this lead over uranium ratio. If it formed at you know, four billion years ago, it would have this uh, ratio. But if at any point it lost lead, it moves towards the age at which it lost lead. So this is what we call a concordant analysis. If we have uranium lead that sits on this curve, and we can be fairly confident about the age of that. But if it loses lead at some point, so this one is a 3.8 billion year old zircon that lost lead about a billion years ago, it moves towards the point at a billion years. So actually, even if we've lost lead, if we measure a bunch of analyses, we can actually get this, um, this regression line and we can actually extrapolate back up and find out how old was it originally and what time did it lose lead. So this, this makes it pretty unique in the isotopic systems as we can actually tell when it's been disturbed very, very easily. So what can we do with this? Um, yeah, so um, we, we can find the oldest rocks on Earth. Um, this is the, the 4.02 billion year old at Castor Nice in Canada. It's up in, in northern Canada um, in the Northwest Territories. It's about 300 kilometers from the nearest town. Um, this is a picture. This is part of the outcrop. This is part of the oldest rocks on Earth. So this is all 4.2 billion years old. And what's pretty amazing about this is um, a friend of mine actually mapped this area and they did a bunch of zircon dating. And usually when you go to rocks this old, most of the ages are discordant and pushed down to younger ages. But I think it was something like two thirds of the 150 odd zircons that they dated um, came out with these four billion year old ages. So it's a really, really well preserved slice of the oldest crust on Earth. And you can see here, this is a zoomed in shot on the Concordia diagram. So we're just taking this little chunk up here around four billion years. And you can see all these ellipses are the um, analyses that they did. And the vast majority of them cluster around four billion years. Um, there's different types of analyses of zircon that I'm not, not going to get into, but the most precise one is this type of analysis, which is called a, a, a TIMS or thermal ionization mass spectrometry analysis. And this is zoomed in on the Concordia. This is so precise that the, the uncertainty in the age is less than the uncertainty in the Concordia curve. And they found that this was 4 billion and 14 years plus or minus 0.3 million years. So it's absolutely astonishing. Um, how well they did. It depends a little bit on how you interpret it, because again, the, the error is less than the Concordia. So if you project it up to the, the average age here, it's about 4.02. If you just take it at face value, it's about 4.01 or so. 
these are incredibly old rocks. Um, so that's a very cool thing you can do. The oldest minerals on Earth that, that we know about, that we can actually date, are also zircons. And this is from the, the Jack Hill zircons. So these are, um, these, are, these are pretty amazing. So most of our evidence of what the earliest, earliest Earth was like comes from this one locality. There's a few other places on Earth where you get similar stuff that is, that is over 4 billion years old in a sedimentary rock. But this one there's a, the, has the largest proportion of these super, super old zircons. And so these ones, based on the chemistry of the zircon and some of the inclusions inside them, they appear to have come from some sort of granitoid. Um, but they're actually eroded from that granitoid, and we find them in a 3.1 billion year old um, metasedimentary sandstone. So the sandstone itself has actually been up to amphibolite fasces. So these things were in a granite, one of the, you know, probably one of the oldest granitoid rocks on Earth. They were exposed above the surface at some point about 3.1 billion years ago, they were eroded into a sandstone, deposited, then they got metamorphosed, and now we can still find these, these little fragments, these leftover remnants of that original crust, even though we can't see the crust anymore. Um, so these are different uh, spots, and these are, these are the, uh, a type of in situ analysis um, using something called an ion microprobe. Doesn't matter too much what it is, but the point is that you can actually um, find the ages of very specific areas. And these, these are probably about 20 or 30 microns across. This is the oldest one here, and this particular analysis was 4.4 billion years old. Um, so yeah, if you measure the rare earth element compositions of the zircon, they're, they're consistent with having a light rare earth element enriched um, source. Um, the inclusions and other parts of the composition tell you that the melt was silica saturated, and we can see that it had a europium anomaly. So this, this, is a, this is a granite, right? It's highly enriched rare earth elements. It's crystallized and lost plagioclase, and um, that's, that's just what we'd expect from a granite. So they provide evidence for like some of the earliest continental crust. There's also um, some evidence in the oxygen isotope composition that there was surface water at the time. So we maybe had a very early ocean forming on Earth. And um, bringing us a bit, a bit more back to the present day. Um, so you, th they can be really useful for identifying the sources of granite. And this is actually a study from the uh, Cerro del uh, Oyazo day site again. And so it's not strictly a granite, but it's the same melting process, right? Um, it's just that this happened to erupt as a volcano. So the zircons here survived erosion, metamorphism, and melting. And what we can do is, when you look at the zircons in detail, there's some zircons that, you know, this one's 7.6 million years old, this one's 6.7 million years old, this one's 9.5. These are all magmatic ages, similar to that Cabo de Gata area, right? This is, this is similar to the age of the magmatism that produced the, the, the volcano itself. But in the course of some of these, it starts to get really old. So this one's 550 million years old, this one's uh, 2.1 billion years old, um, I think there's older. So the, the, the very oldest one, this is the Oyatso Day site, you have 2.7 billion year old zircons in that. So if we measure a bunch of these zircons, we get this kind of probability density function that is a bit like a fingerprint for a rock. And so uh, what, they, uh, what they've done in this paper, and I didn't put it up, this is, this is Zek and, and Williams 2002, this guy who used to work at this department. Um, is they analyzed a bunch of these cores and they produced this, this probability density plot. And then they analyzed um, the same uh, grains in the, in the restites, uh, in the enclaves inside the, in the, inside the volcano. And they also analyzed nearby metamorphic rocks. So these are the graphitic schists that we saw um, as, uh, when we were on the metamorphic day. And then these are some, some nices that are even, even higher grade. Um, and so by comparing them, you can see that the, the El Hayata Day site, not only does it have components as old as 2.7 billion years old, um, some of these spikes in the metamorphic rocks are repeated in here. So we can actually see that the, those metamorphic rocks were the ones that were melting to make, this, uh, to make this day site. And what's cool here is we both have these, these meta sediments, these graphitic schists, but these, these gneisses are actually gneisses of S-type granites, and these are the ones that have the 2.7 billion year old age peak and that we see in the Oyatso day site. And so this is like a multiple sedimentary cycles where we've had a sediment 
that's then been brought to high pressure, it's been melted, it's made an S-type granite. Then we've had another separate sediment formed then both of those have been metamorphosed to produce the melt that eventually went on to form this volcano. So we've got two sedimentary cycles and, and burial and metamorphism and melting going into making these volcanic rocks. All right, that's all I had on Zircon. I could talk about it a lot more. Um, you, you will come up against it again, I, I, I promise you, um, in the rest of your, your courses here. So Zircon is this incredibly resistant mineral that uh, commonly forms in granitoids and it can survive pretty much everything the earth can throw at it. Erosion, high grade metamorphism, and melting to form granite. Contains quite a lot of uranium, uh, but in excludes lead, which is incompatible. So it can be dated using radioactive decay of uranium to lead. The two isotopes allow us, of uranium allow us to find undisturbed ages and to identify lead loss events using a Concordia diagram. And zircon uranium lead ages can be used both to date igneous rocks and to identify the sources of sedimentary rocks or granites. In terms of reading, uh, the Gill textbook, chapters 8 and 9, uh, Winter chapter 18. And if you want to give it a go, try the, the Chaplin white paper. It's on Absalon. It's not, it's not particularly hardcore. And I think it will hopefully uh, flesh out some of these ideas. They include the original abstract. And then they talk a bit about like where things have gone in the subsequent 25 years. I mean, that was until 2001. So things have, have kept moving. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And there's a summary. Uh, thanks a lot.